interesting and extensive talk. I want to thank all the speakers of this session. And my technical session is over. Now the uh, it's up to Alok and others to take care of the discussion session. All right. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much. So I think uh, we can uh, dive right into the discussion session. And uh, I think uh, Professor Maharana can take over from here. Yeah. <clears throat> Hello. So what is the upper bound? Uh, it's a tough question. Uh, we are uh, perhaps... Sunday, uh, Sunday evening. Okay. Right. Uh, maybe <laughs> half hour. I mean, uh, it was supposed to end at 6.30. We already six past six. So right. will 30 minutes, so maybe 40 if stretched suffice. Okay. So, so you use the guillotine. No, 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 no. I, I am horrible. If my kids don't listen to me. I mean, how the heck am I going <laughs> to? Things might get, uh, you know, get prolonged. Okay. So. Yeah, I, I would just uh, give you a, a tinkle. I mean, uh, that, okay. okay. Maybe we can. Order of 40 minutes. Okay. Right. Very good. So. Sunil has put up, a, put up his hand. He wants to make, talk something. Who? Sunil. Oh, so he, he wants to only talk at the end, right? No, I had a question. I, had a, I don't know. When you're throwing it open for questions, then I have a question for one of the speakers. Usually we discuss, we have we allow questions for speakers or we don't have that? Okay, so, okay yeah. Sunil, I thought, the, I suggest the following. Because I thought the people who have been participating, they have very little chance to comment, okay? So I'll suggest the people who are participants they might make a comment on somebody's lecture and then the speaker might respond. Because if it be a question answer, I have some nine speakers, okay? Two questions each and you can imagine how long it will go. So how, how do people like this idea? I didn't completely understand. You're oh, allowing comments, but not questions. Is that it? I, I, no, no, there's no, there's no, not really no, an invariant distinction between comments no, and questions. No, but no, if you no, have no. Um, if you have a bunch of quest, people asking questions, you can start with them, and I'll come in later. That's not a problem. No, no, no. What I was suggesting there are several topics. Okay, on one topic. Okay, there mm. have been two, three talks. So mm. I was suggesting that actually let there be some comments and then the speakers can respond in, mm -hmm. instead of asking individual speakers individual questions. Okay, okay. Is it acceptable or we go by conventional? Sure, sure, no, no problem. Okay, so uh, this is one. So as you can see, uh, there have been uh, you know diverse topics. So this is not a theme-based uh, day. Okay, so... Uh, I was thinking, but then I, maybe I should uh, should not do it. Uh, I was thinking to say a few words about this uh, dispersion relation and analyticity. Is it okay or what do people say? Yeah, please go ahead, please. Okay. So <clears throat> I'll spend five, seven minutes on the uh, classical results in the sense <clears throat> the way analyticity was proved, let us say, 60 years ago. So that was based on the LSZ formulation of field theory, which actually assumes vacuum and operators of self-adjoint and microcausality, and then plus the LSZ assumptions like asymptotic fields, interacting fields, interpolation, and so on. So based on that, I'll just tell you the results. So if you take equal mass particles of mass m, then <clears throat> since all the masses are physical in LSZ, so there is a cut, right hand cut starting at s is equal to 4m square, and there is left hand cut starting at u is equal to 4m square. But s plus t plus u is equal to 4m square. So in the s plane, you can say that there is a right hand cut and left hand cut. Now, what is proved is fixed dispersion relation for T, not any arbitrary value of T, for uh, physical T, which is negative, 
but lying within Lehman, Lehman Martha ellipse, which is a small ellipse. So you can only prove that the scattering amplitude is analytic in S for fixed value of t. So you can write a dispersion relation, which is actually the amplitude is related to integral over ds for the imaginary part of the scattering amplitude, v1. Second, which you can show as much rigor as you like, that the amplitude, the, this amplitude, the mod of this amplitude is bounded by a polynomial in S. This is called the polynomial boundedness. In fact, you can prove a little bit more. This is actually due to Jean or Martha that the amplitude is bounded by at most, it will need two subtractions. Okay. So therefore, you can write fixed T dispersion relation with finite number of subtractions. Okay. As he pointed out, this is not crossing symmetric, okay, because you have the S channel discontinuity and U channel discontinuity, or discontinuity. But based on that, actually you can derive what is called the Frossa bound, that the cross section cannot grow faster than log S square. Okay. So this recently has become a little bit relevant in the context of uh, conformal field theories, because in conformal field theories, you don't have a scattering amplitude. Okay. You cannot put particles on shelf so on. So this is correlation functions or actually the Whiteman functions. So to prove and crossing can be proved in LSD rigorously. Okay. Really, you can prove crossing rigorously. This is Bross, Epstein, and Glaser. But in, in case of conformal field theory, it is the Whiteman functions. So it is a lot more harder to prove crossing in the sense that you can analytically continue one Whiteman function to another permuted one. Take, for example, three point function. There are six Whiteman functions. Okay. I think, to the best of my knowledge, this has not really been rigorously proved as in case of quantum field theory. And now people are beginning to explore these things. So I think I'll stop here unless somebody has any question. Now, I sort of uh, now I so, uh, now invite comments. Comments, questions. But when you ask a question, please mention the name of the speaker whom you are asking. Sunil has his hands raised and raised. Hmm? Sunil Alok. Okay. Gautam wants to ask a question. No, no, I don't want to ask a question. I'm just saying Sunil has his hand raised. Alok yes. has his hand raised. Survey yes. has his hand raised. Yes, Sunil, yes. Yeah, my question was for Rajesh, uh, also any of his collaborators or anyone who wants to comment. You know, a little bit, uh, just uh, again, I wanted to sort of uh, ask something related to what I asked in the morning. Uh, Rajesh, are you there or? Rajesh is not. No, no, I'm here. Oh, he's there, he's there. Okay, yeah. Uh, so, you know, when when you say free Yang-Mills theory, I'm always confused by one thing. So literally, if we take G Yang-Mills to zero, then it just falls apart into n copies of free Maxwell theory. No, no sign of the non-abelian structure constants is there. Is that what the limit means? Or is there some memory in this limit? Uh, is the limit subtle in such a way that the non-abelian nature is still there on that side? Yeah, because you have to impose the cross law constraint uh, still, even as G Yang Mills goes to zero. So in that sense, it is not just a sum of free. Uh, okay. So it's the non-abelian Gauss law constraint. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That's very nice. The second question is: um, if G string goes to zero and G string n, that is Toft coupling, also goes to zero, that's where you're in the side of free uh, string theory. Uh, uh, yeah, the free whatever uh, free string theory, I guess. Um, yeah. I mean, free in the sense that it's uh, the quantum. Uh, it's three level string theory. Yes. Yeah, three level. Three level. Sorry, classical. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Now, um, in this limit, we are we were talking in the morning about the Ramon Ramon flux that in Green Schwartz formalism is normally there on the on the in the world sheet theory. So you said something like it 
formally goes to zero because it's proportional to GSN, but also, you know, it's there somehow to stabilize the background. So yeah. I was wondering if you can sort of elaborate and in particular, is there some limit, some quantity between GS and N which is kept finite because GSN is going to zero, N is going to infinity. So is there some speed at which GS is going to zero? That's maybe yeah. related to the but question. But GS to zero and uh, I mean, normally you would take GS to zero and N to infinity such that GSN takes a fixed value. Right. Now, in some sense, that fixed value, you're then further taking to zero. Uh, so in some ways, GS is going faster to zero than N is going to infinity, but not necessarily parametrically. I think just uh, in just in a, uh, 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 that combination is going to zero. So yeah, so in some ways, it's a, it's a theory with uh, no free parameters uh, uh, and at that point uh, there is uh, uh, so this is why uh, the free theory at n goes to infinity you have an infinite spectrum things are spaced of order one uh, there's a spectrum i mean yeah conformal dimensions which are all spaced in integer spacing and that's all there isn't any scale um, uh, that point but uh, of course uh, yeah was that your question i mean uh, uh, that that was sort of the question but i was just wondering you know we could take any i mean in principle you can take any limit of two parameters and ask what is the resulting theory in worst case it would be uninteresting but what if you take say g string times some power of n to be fixed it, does that uh, it, does that contradict any of the limits you've taken so, so g string uh, n squared is fixed G, G string, uh, if uh, so, G string n square is fixed is the same uh, as saying that G string is going like one over root n, uh, right? No, one over n squared. Uh, sorry, you have one over n square. Yeah, so the different limit. Uh, uh, the, uh, G, uh, so, yeah, I mean, I don't know whether there's anything particularly good on that parametric limit uh, as mm. such, which. Um, yeah, uh, at least I am not aware of anything. You don't want to do the other way around where G string N blows up. But no, no, G string N has to go to zero. zero. So I was just, uh, just trying to understand. I mean, of course, the <laughs> conventional wisdom is G string N is held fixed. And then the fixed number is taken to zero as a new independent parameter. So yeah, that's what you said. I'm just wondering if we take other double scale limits. Uh, is, is the things that you developed, are they applicable to those limits also? Because then there would be a parameter. It was just trying to understand the whole parameter space of this. Yeah, I mean, I think the, in the limit, uh, it would just be the same free Yang Mills uh, as, I, as far as I can uh, uh, think. And I don't know whether that parameter really would enter into anything uh, because perturbative field theory, you you have under control. So mm -hmm. you can do it for small thrift coupling. You can do perturbative yang mills for small thrift coupling. Small right. thrift coupling in your um, language corresponds to lambda over n. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, oh. your right. little, uh, so you, you have some lambda tilde, which is g string right, right. n square, which will be something, whatever, lambda mm -hmm. square over n, I guess, uh, the conventional lambda square mm -hmm. over n. Now, on perturbation theory, you organize in the large n Actually, limit. it would be conventional lambda squared over gs. Sorry, uh, no, I, I'm just thinking in terms of the Yang-Mills theory. So Yang-Mills theory has two parameters, lambda and n. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, let me call what you, you said gs n square yeah. is lambda Tilda. That would be lambda, yeah, that would be lambda n or lambda uh, squared so over. You could uh, think of that as, um, uh, oh, sorry, yeah, uh, I think uh, you want to think of that as lambda tilde times, lambda tilde is usual lambda times n. Right. Uh, uh, so keeping lambda tilde finite is not something in G string Yang Mills perturbation theory. Mm. Uh, uh, you don't you you wouldn't have a you wouldn't have any thing uh, meaningful i think in that perturbation theory the toft limit is the limit which has a meaningful perturbative expansion where you 
organize things by organized gene. Organized by double line diagrams. Yeah. yeah. I see. Okay. Thanks. I think that's, that's quite so, good. Should I ask uh, Sovik? Uh, Sovik has raised his hand. I think Surbi uh, was, was ahead of me. Yeah. Maybe she should go first. Okay. So please go ahead, Surbi. Yeah, hi. Uh, my question uh, is for Professor uh, Arnab Kundu. Uh, so basically, I wanted to uh, uh, ask him to elaborate a little bit more on uh, the comments he made in the end about uh, uh, the relation of the OTOC to the growth of local uh, Oh, okay. Um, first of all, uh, okay, that was... Uh... Uh, uh, that was really a comment. I don't have anything very precise to say in the sense that, uh, um, uh, uh, let me think just for a moment, um, it, it's, it's not, uh, it's not uh, obvious that there is a, there is a clear, uh, clear relation that you can write down uh, in terms of uh, uh, linking uh, operator growth with PDC uh, or for that matter, any correlator, for example. So, uh, uh, so the reason simply is that, I mean, uh, well, first of all, there are multiple notions of operator growth, but if you take the most uh, conventional sense, most uh, conservative one, which is basically in terms of how a local operator grows in the, uh, in the Hilbert space of operators, for example, okay. uh, this Krilov notion, for example, which, uh, lattice, uh, uh, which in the lattice uh, community have been used uh, uh, for a long time without talking in terms of this language. Uh, there, uh, what you compute are given a local operator, essentially some nested commutators uh, with the Hamiltonian. Okay. So it's a, it's a very specific commu commutator that you are computing. But uh, my comment was really loose in, in the sense that, uh, um, uh, uh, okay, so let me put it this way. So, so what happens or, or, or the connections that people can make with, for example, quantities like how fast information is pr propagating or a, a, a local operator is spreading, et cetera. Uh, 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 they're usually done, uh, uh, they, they can be connected to correlators provided you choose very specific operators uh, with which you want to connect. So for example, you, you can take uh, one of your operators, you compute OTOC or not, it doesn't matter. Suppose you compute some four point function or some higher point function. In that higher point function, you take one of your operators to be the density matrix itself, for example. That would be a very extreme choice. Okay. But if you make such a choice or a special choice, uh, but if you make such a choice, then uh, there are connections you can draw. So, um, um, but I, I have to think about it. I, I don't want to say that you cannot, you probably can, but I am not aware of an immediate uh, connection that you uh, that, that you can drop, but perhaps you could. Uh, Sorry, can, can I can I just comment one, on this? Can I just ask one question first. Sorry. Uh, right. So, is this uh, row? Uh, I mean, the the four point function you said is it like a four point function of row a density matrix? And uh, no, no, no. So what you do is typically you take, let's say, for example, you take one of the operator to be the density matrix, and then you take a, other two operators as some light operators that you have in the spectrum. Okay. Okay. So then, uh, I mean, for example, uh, you know, this method that I mentioned very, very, uh, 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 very impressionistically about uh, uh, the mean field uh, uh, approach of computing higher point correlators, mm -hmm. essentially at some very basic level, it's that. What you are doing is you, you, you think two of your operate, let's say you're computing some end point correlator. Yep. You take two of your correlator or N minus two light operators, and then the rest of the group, you take it to be uh, somehow uh, as, uh, as as a part of your background. So so they, they are like really creating a state. So therefore you can think of it as, uh, you know, being replaced by an appropriate density matrix. But oh, okay, these are all words really. I mean, the, the mathematics are a bit more complicated um, uh, if you want to do it in quantum field theory. In quantum mechanics, you can you can get by uh, with, uh, uh, with a little less work, that is true. Uh, but uh, it's also useful. Uh, for, I mean, in terms of intuition, it's actually quite quite useful. Um, I see, uh, but, and, and this is related yeah. to. Uh, I mean, so these operators can be then out of time ordered. Uh, yes, yes, certainly, certainly. The light. I mean, I, I mean, for example, in some sense, when you create heavy states in CFT and you compute, let's say, heavy heavy light light correlator, right? Yeah, that's these, the these are out of time order because yeah. the heavy states you take to be t plus infinity, t minus infinity, and you are putting some other operators at two different times. 
So, uh, I mean, you can do that sort of thing, but uh, it's less interesting because uh, you have really created a state and now uh, it's equivalent to computing a two point function in that state. Right, right. Uh, but, so, but what you're talking about is different. You're talking about uh, maybe uh, like instead of four point functions, three point functions of uh, the density matrix and uh, some light operators. Uh, yeah, you can certainly do that. Uh, you can certainly do that. Um, um, yes, all I was saying is that if you want to make connections, typically with higher point correlation function, uh, with uh, with quantities like operator growth or or more information theoretic aspects, let let me put it this way, then it it, it seems to me that you need to make some special choices of some operators, a subset of those operators, to make those connections. So they are not always true for any 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 operator. I mean that is evidently true. Okay. Uh, but of course, what you said is also also very interesting in the sense that if you, for, for example, when you take, let's forget about OTOs, I mean, just correlators, when you take density matrix itself or the partition function itself as an, as an operator, you compute correlators of the partition functions, then you start seeing very intricate structures uh, of the spectrum uh, of the theory. I mean, that is evident in quantum mechanics, for example. And nowadays people are also doing a, a, extensively exploring these things in quantum field theory, CFT, etc. So, um, so, so yeah, I mean, I, I don't have anything precise, but maybe, maybe Shovik had something, uh, something uh, precise. Yeah, to say. yeah, I think, I think this, this connection is sort of precise. So, so the thing which you mentioned is, is, is this grill of complexity. Yeah. So that actually provides an upper bound to uh, a number of other observables. So, and in fact, it can be proved that uh, the growth of this uh, krill of complexity is provides an upper bound for the o growth of the OTOC. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, good, good. Yeah. Yes, yes, thanks. thanks. So, that, that is absolutely right. Yes, 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 indeed, 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 indeed. But what I think I was uh, taking the question too literally in the sense that whether you can actually connect the operator to the to the to the uh, yeah yeah in in some physical sense you you I mean it is measuring something like that because the OTOC you can you we know that it is measuring the inability of one of the evolved operators to its failure to commute with another simple operator yes this W and V which you had yes. so yeah and the krill of complexity provides an upper bound. Uh, for for that yeah yeah yeah, yeah indeed, indeed what is this string of complexity shavik uh, i mean what kind of correlator are you computing there uh, so this is not actually given by some correlation function but uh, yeah you choose some evolution <laughs> protocol and then uh, it is a sort of the average uh, it, it's it is a sum over probabilities of being in a particular state yeah uh, well i i'm actually talking a bit about this i mean in my talk like on Wednesday, I think. Yeah. So, so just to sort of continue on, uh, on so we actually reminded me of something in, in, in SYK, but that's a specific model, but in SYK, there is a very precise definition of operator growth. That's just in terms of, uh, you know, fields that are present in the, in, the, in the model. And you can indeed show that that definition, you can massage it a little bit to relate it to an OTOC. There, such a precise connection exists. So, so given a particular model, uh, and if it's uh, rich enough like SYK, for example, then this massaging, et cetera, can be done to, to probably to match it at that level. Uh, but uh, but uh, yes, so what Shovik said, that certainly exists for uh, 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 always, that uh, a, as an upper bound, there is always a, always a connection. Shovik, so, you have any more question? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, so my question was for Rajesh, actually. Um, uh, so yes. Yes, uh, is Rajesh around? Nobody removed him. Uh, <laughs> left. Yeah, hi. hi, 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 Rajesh. Yes, there's a uh, background noise. Sorry, uh, but uh, then, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, uh, so, so sorry, I wasn't present for your talk actually, but I saw your slides and I had this question even before. So, uh, so this, uh you have this correlation functions for twist operators in the uh, symmetric orbit fold. And then um, he, there is this relation in the large twist limit to this uh, uh, matrix model, which you have. Um, 
so there is uh, you, one of the restrictions which is there is that the covering surface uh, should be of genus zero, right? Uh, so I was thinking like if one can uh, sort of lift this restriction and is, can one make uh, some, uh, I mean, can one know something about like if, if one has like, uh, if the genus is greater than zero or so on, like. Uh, uh, yeah, so this has been actually studied from the point of view of the world. Um, uh, I think Lawrence has a Lawrence Eberhardt has a, a paper on this localization property persisting even on higher genus surfaces, uh, and therefore being the covering maps. And the um, similarly, I think the twister incidence relations also. I think there's a paper by Bob Knight and generalizing that to higher genus surface. But maybe what you are asking is. From the point of view of the field theory, this connection to the matrix models, how whether that exists yeah. at the genus. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, I, I think with Pranabesh, we have uh, discussed a little bit about genus one. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's a little interesting, it's somewhat interesting, and I, we don't have the complete picture, but uh, at genus one, there is a similar localization from the point of view of the world sheet theory, you know that there is a localization, because the holomorphic maps, okay, so genus one, uh, but also to thermal ADS, so uh, if you wish, you're looking at uh, correlators, uh, symmetric orbifold correlators of genus zero covering space, but so are corresponding to thermal ADS. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's in some ways the simplest. Um, uh, you have a genus one covering map of the uh, genus one surface because mm -hmm. there the holomorphic maps are easy to characterize. Uh, they are uh, maps from torus to torus. Um, so in that case, uh, the, in, if you take this large twist limit, uh, uh, yeah, in this, uh, so you can ask for the contribution of the partition function itself, even without correlators, even the partition function from the W twisted sector with large W. And they are localized on some very interesting points, discrete points in the torus modelized space. We, this, as far as I know, that's not a matrix model like. But uh, the, it, it seems to be that, uh, again, you can kind of cover the moduli space in the large W limit uh, mm -hmm. and uh, you and this, um, uh, but um, yeah, but, uh, but, uh, but uh, I, okay, I think uh, the short answer is that we don't have yet a complete picture, even in that case, which is the simplest uh, one for higher genus, whether uh, it would be very nice to generalize, I think, uh, to, because in this case, what was nice is the covering maps that were described by a matrix model. That was a, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there may be something more which will involve more complicated matrix models, which involve, you know, like a periodic potential or something like that, uh, uh, as opposed to because you have now some images. Uh, but uh, but I, yeah, uh, but I think the short answer is that uh, that is still not known. Okay. Okay. Mm. okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Arvendra has been waiting for a while. So, Arvendra, please go ahead. Yeah, actually, I have a question with uh, uh, Anshuman. I don't see Anshuman around. So, is he there? I'm here. I'm here. Oh, Anshuman, yeah. Uh, very nice talk, actually. Uh, Anshuman, uh, you were talking about the type 2 fluxes, no? Yes. Uh, yes. This, uh, uh, they were uh, of uh, and this uh, odd ranks, basically anti-symmetric tensor fields, okay, in type 2b. Yes. Uh, what is the situation uh, of the, uh, means uh, same kind of vacuas on type 2a, basically the even fluxes? Uh, is there yes, something no. very different story there? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, it's a different story. So uh, the, uh, and there is progress in understanding model stabilization, but here we get we can write down an explicit uh, ten dimensional solution there it is the internal metric is no longer something like a conformal calabia or something so uh, there is progress but uh, not as much as in the type 2b case i see mm -hmm. uh, i saw recently papers writing on this uh, 
type 2a massive type 2a fluxes and all yes. that uh, people doing some work there so i mean don't, don't we get uh, some uh, kind of models there of the dc yeah, no we can get models but it is not uh, we don't know it as explicitly as in the 2b case because i think as far as i know the 10d solution is not uh, known as explicitly as in to uh, in the 2a case but still there is uh, so more generally uh, there is constant progress in understanding modelized stabilization uh, 2b is probably the place where it is best developed uh, but uh, yes there's work going on okay okay thanks okay if you are done parvendra yeah, okay i can uh, if you allow me i can take a small question to rajesh uh, but this is just uh, uh, rajesh uh, uh, you were writing that equation in the second page where you have left side uh, some operators on the right hand side you have vertex uh, functions for closed string means as i say insertion actually yeah so you are assuming a, a, a symmetry supersymmetry there uh, in everything setup or this will be even can be generalized to some non supersymmetric backgrounds or something of that sort so uh, i i was uh, trying to write down a statement which would be true for uh, gauge string dualities in all cases where we know such a duality exists so there is a, if there's a string theory dual to uh, the corresponding quantum field theory uh, now most of the cases we know are of course uh, supersymmetric uh, but i uh, but i think the statement is more general and uh, and probably there are uh, general cases of non supersymmetric backgrounds uh, um, and i would hope let's say for pure young mills also something like this should be true but of course we don't we have much less uh, we we don't have any at the moment even any very there a very um, good indication of what the right hand side might be the string theory or the same but I, i would imagine it's a more general statement yes that statement is just a statement about the, what you would expect for a general uh, gauge string duality dictionary i see but there are uh, backwards in like uh, uh, you can write down uh, ads4 if, uh, times as six refund driven backward in a massive type 2a kind of gauge supergravities which yeah. are not uh, supersymmetric at all but since being ads4 and uh, uh, you expect a boundary cft there uh, which uh, i don't know whether it is supersymmetric or it should not be but uh, so, yeah, all uh, that should uh, apply there also isn't that uh, apply there again i should say uh, this is for cases which have a string theory perturbative string theory dual because uh, you need to have um, uh, you need to have uh, that uh, the right hand side was defined in terms of some perturbative uh, sigma model uh, i'm not including cases like uh, m theory or something like that um, and so those whether supersymmetric or non supersymmetric are not included in this uh, um, so yeah but uh, the kind of cases you mentioned i, I presume if uh, these are uh, uh, type 2 string compactifications yes, right? yes, yes. Uh, presumably if the string theory is well behaved uh, then uh, there whatever the dual field theory is it uh, there should be some dictionary okay if arvindra you are done i yeah, yeah, thanks yeah. Thank Okay, I have a question for Anshuman actually. So, uh, this is regarding the flux compactification in type two B that uh, he was uh, discussing, where he was talking about small top knot. Uh, uh, so, the actually it so happens that uh, the flux compactification in two B is very much uh, analogous to. Uh, the attractor mechanism equations in type 2a okay. and uh, in type 2a you can also have uh, non supersymmetric attractors and uh, the stability of these attractors uh, are very nicely analyzed by uh, by studying the minimal cycles 
Uh, so I don't think there is uh, anything analogous in type 2B. Uh, so uh, uh, if there is something which is analogous in type 2B, then it would be interesting to study non-supersymmetric uh, vacua in type 2B itself. Do you think, I mean, studying small double knot which doesn't have supersymmetry is, I mean, has it been studied? What is the status of uh, these, uh, these vacua? Or is there a mechanism that is there to analyze them and their stability? So, uh, I mean, this, I mean, you know, once you uh, incorporate the Kähler modelized stabilization uh, at small W naught, you will get uh, ADS vacua, which are supersymmetric. Uh, so, uh, I guess your suggestion is that can these be analyzed by attractor? Yeah, no, KKL, that is the standard KKLT scenario where you start with a supersymmetric vacua and then you break supersymmetry by adding anti D3 brain. Mm -hmm. That is because, the, the, because of the issues of stability, right? Yeah. Uh, but uh, in type 2A, you can analyze the stability just by analyzing the minimal cycles. Yes. So, uh, so then in type 2B also, if, if one can do similar things, then you don't have to search uh, for small double knot which preserves supersymmetry. You can, I mean, there will be a whole uh, lot of uh, non supersymmetric solutions also which can admit small double knot. And then that can be lifted to the sitter. Okay. I don't know whether it's a reasonable question to ask. Yes. Well, at least, I mean, I guess probably I'm not uh, exactly getting the parameter space that you're going, but if you look at this uh, uh, LVS vacuum, so there the, the ADS minimum that you get is, uh, uh, is non super symmetric. Okay. Uh, so uh, now there, uh, none of the known alpha prime corrections uh, destabilize this ADS vacuum. Uh, but in principle, there can be uh, one alpha prime correction, which uh, can be dangerous for the uh, for its stability. Uh, now, the usual philosophy taken is that you will, if needed, you will tune parameters to uh, keep it under control. But there is no evidence so far for uh, such an alpha prime correction, the one that is uh, potentially dangerous in the sense that people have tried to uh, look, look at you know, toroidal settings and uh, maybe orbifolds and wrapping brains. And so far, there's no evidence uh, for the existence of this alpha prime correction. But maybe what you are suggesting might be related to this thing that how, if one is interested in ADS vacua, which are non supersymmetric uh, in 2B, which is uh, the LVS. Uh, then what you say could be relevant. So we could talk about this uh, yeah. in more detail. Okay, okay. okay. thank you. Sir. Alok has been waiting for a while. Alok, please. You mean the one with two ways, right, me? <laughs> no, no, because you raised your hand. Ah, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. okay, no, the two, of, two of us, right, one with two, one with one A, so, okay. <clears throat> so, yeah, uh, yeah, I just, uh, so I wanted to uh, actually make some comments uh, 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 in response to uh, Prashanta's uh, query and uh, um, maybe also it can be translated into a question to uh, Anshuman. So um, the, the couple of things, the first thing is that uh, if one is familiar with a story on one side, uh, let's say in uh, uh, type 2B, one is interested in finding out the story in type 2A and one is dealing with the uh, compactifications involving projective varieties, which do possess a mirror. So usually uh, it is, it would be very surprising that that is not the case. So there should be some analog of pretty much everything uh, on one side as well as the other side. With that said, uh, I, I thought that uh, when you talk about the super potential, especially a la uh, Gukov, Waffa, Witten, uh, so the whole idea of flux times calibration would usually make sense when you have supersymmetry. 
if you don't have supersymmetry, I'm not sure uh, that expression really has a whole lot of meaning. Uh, so you may want to consider generalizing uh, the group of alpha Witten superpotential to address Prashantha's query about uh, non-supersymmetric uh, compactifications. Uh, so that, that's just a, a couple of remarks. And uh, one, one last remark, I thought, I mean, uh, uh, I, I don't know if Sandeep is around, uh, I don't know, but uh, I mean, uh, uh, apart from, I mean, uh, there are papers, I guess, though I haven't really not followed this up, but I know that there are papers by Kalosh, uh, Kachru, uh, and, uh, and McAllister, and probably also Sandeep, uh, uh, which have to do with, uh, you know, essentially justifying uh, KKLT. Uh, but uh, in terms of concrete type 2B flux compactification resulting in a, a de Sitter vacuum, I don't know if that is a settled question. I mean, I thought that is that is a that is a very uh, gray area, and definitely, I mean, I, I guess people like Vafa would say that that's literally in the swamp plan. So I'm not sure uh, what one would mean. Uh, you you can you can be optimistic that okay, if it works, if the KKLT is can be realized, you can first stabilize the Kähler moduli, then you go to the complex structure moduli, then maybe stuff can happen. Or, for example, if you're working with no scale supergravity with the exclusion of high derivative corrections, uh, then you know that if you look at the, the, the super potential, it is e to the k times mod dw squared minus three times mod w squared, where you would be summing over all the moduli. But if you have a no scale uh, supergravity, then the, uh, the contribution to mod dw squared coming from the Kähler moduli precisely cancel the thrice mod w squared. And therefore, it suffices to work just with the complex structure moduli. But that, uh, as, as Anshuman, you know, that it would break down with the inclusion of hydrodynamic correction, right? And the last remark is that uh, if you are actually uh, following, uh, if you're actually doing a bona fide uh, uh, type 2B uh, compactification with the inclusion of hydrodynamic corrections, you don't have a choice, but you know that the, the first non-trivial correction is going to arise at order alpha prime Q, right? That's the, the, the paper uh, by the Becker sisters, uh, and Michael Hawke at all, right? So, I mean, there's not a whole lot of choice there. So that, that, this is some remarks that I wanted to make. And uh, so now, I, I, can I, I, can I uh, uh, Professor Marana, can I come to my query? Yeah, please. Okay, so uh, Anshuman, you, I think uh, I, I might've misunderstood or didn't quite hear it or understand or all of the three. So you made some remark uh, to the effect that something which was cubic in the, was it the pre-potential or was it, Something was assumed, are you going to be assuming that is to be dropped? Uh, uh, is, is that right? Something you said to that effect? No, it is uh, uh, this. Okay, so let me just uh, kind of put things a little bit uh, in context for everybody. So, uh, I mean, what I was discussing in what you're referring to is uh, the recent construction by the Cornell group. Uh, for small uh, uh, W0, uh, for small, so choice of fluxes that leads to a small W0. And here uh, they, uh, I think they make, and in that limit, okay, so they say that if you work in the large complex structure limit, there the form of the the super potential we can uh, is uh, is known to be polynomial plus exponentially small corrections and the prescription is that you choose the fluxes so that this uh, this polynomial part is homogeneous degree two and once you have that then uh, there is a essentially depending on some properties of the exponentially small corrections, uh, you can get, end up with a very small value of W0. So this is an explicit prescription. And, you know, they actually do have many examples and our work was also related to that in the sense that we can, the Diophantine equations that you get, uh, we provide a systematic way to get solutions to this. So what this provides is uh, one way to get vacua with small w0. Uh, and this is most likely not the only way. There are other ways. 
Now, uh, on your comment about uh, uh, what the you know how this fits in into the bigger uh, what conjectures about the existence or non-existence of uh, uh, Dissiter vacua. Uh, so, if you look at say in particular, if you look at KKLT, there are certain things that we require. And one of them is small w0. So what this part of the story is, is that you now have explicit constructions for small w0. Now, this was known from statistical expectation. So if you did the usual statistical expectation, you would, ex you would think that they are there. The improvement is that now people have, they'll tell you the exact Calabiaus and the flux quanta that give you small w zero. So this doesn't mean that the you know the story is closed. There is a lot more to explore, uh, but this is a, a way to get more concrete, uh, uh, more concrete constructions, and eventually they should ha have effect on understanding the phenomenology of these uh, systems. On your alpha prime uh, correction comments, see, that is an n equals to two corrections. So now that you're turning, turning on fluxes and brains, uh, putting in brains, so there is the possibility of having other corrections. So some of those corrections are, if it was just the alpha prime Q corrections, LVS uses that and uh, there is, you know, the vacuum is certainly stable. Even some of the n equals to one corrections, those that have been computed, uh, to them, uh, anything that has been found, uh, LVS is stable. But if you look at, uh, I think if you just uh, expand the Kähler potential uh, and put use general arguments as to the form of the Kähler potential, uh, in principle, there can be one and equals to one correction, but that has never been found. I mean, people have uh, expected, uh, I mean, done computations to see if it is there. In all examples, it's not there. If it is there, then some tuning would be needed. So this would be analogous to the tuning that you need for W0 small. Uh, yeah, so that's from my side. Maybe some, I'm sure Sandeep has some comments. Uh, actually, I had some, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, there are several other people. Uh, I, I had a couple of things as follow-ups uh, to Anshuman's. Uh, I don't know if I, if I can go ahead. Uh, maybe I should wait. Yeah, Uttam has been waiting for a while. Yeah, so. absolutely. Okay, sure. Uttam, please, if you are around. Uh, thank you again. Yeah, uh, I have a very brief question for Rajesh. Is Rajesh around? Yeah, I... yeah, yeah, Rajesh is there. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I have to leave in about three minutes, unfortunately. Yeah, but it, yeah it's a very, it's a very nice question and very brief. I, I, maybe you had already explained it. I couldn't catch it. So, what is the significance of the tensionless sector uh, in your analysis, Rajesh? How, how does it come about? If you can say a few words about free, it. Uh, free angles is believed to be dual to the tensionless limit of the string theory. That is the point. Uh, the tensionless limit you can think of. In some ways, if you you can almost define it as that corresponding to the free angles point, uh, because that is in some ways the point with the smallest uh, string, uh, ADS scale, the point where um, there are massless higher spin fields, uh, and uh, so all these you can think of as the signatures of a tensionless uh, string theory. Uh, so, so, so in, in that sense, in ADS, the notion of tensionless is captured by the dimensionless coupling, which is the uh, Toft coupling. And that going to zero is, if you wish, the notion of tensionless, uh, because there is a radius of ADS scale and there is the string scale. And in some ways, this is the small. Uh, when the TOF coupling is zero, that's sort of the smallest value of this. So, uh, so it is in that sense tensionless. Uh, now, of course, uh, you expect the dual world sheet theory to be also simplify in that limit, and that's indeed what we find in ADS three, and uh, we propose for ADS five. It has this sort of level one kind of uh, description, which turns out to be a, have a free theory. 
a free world sheet theory also. So, uh, so in many ways, these are some of the features you might have expected of a tensionless limit, and you have in this case. Does that answer the question? Uh, Thank. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you. Okay, Alok, your turn. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, I just uh, wanted to say this, uh, uh, that maybe I'm a little uh, lost in terms of the terminology which is used. So usually uh, uh, when you talk about these polynomial uh, contributions, one is not referring to the super potential, but one is actually in special geometry referring to the pre-potential. So I think that's probably what you imply, uh, Anshuman? Yeah, yes, well, you can, I mean, but you can, I mean, in these, this limit, you, you can compute, I mean, you start with the pre-potential, but then uh, you can use that data to compute the super potential and even the super potential has this structure. Uh, uh, well, okay. Uh, the other thing is that usually uh, when you talk about these uh, polynomial expansions, yeah. that's uh, in the, in the Kähler sector, the complexified Kähler, you, one uses the complexified Kähler class yeah. and uh, one has the linear term, the quadratic term and the cubic term. And if one goes up to the non-perturbative contributions as well as alpha prime corrections, you have a shift and you have this infinite series of Walshian instantons mod modulated by the genus zero Gobakumar Waffa invariants. Yes. So that is the usual one. And in fact, the cubic term is the one which appears with the classical intersection number. Yes. So are you referring to the same expansion? Yes, but in the, uh, uh, in the, uh, in the 2B side, okay? So uh, the, here you are essentially using uh, the mirror uh, story. So um, okay. these, uh, the, so that's why you are in the large complex structure limit of the Calabria. So you want, I mean, in the right conventions where the, uh, the, the axionic fields are real, you want uh, imaginary Z to be, uh, to be large. And that in the language that you are talking uh, in, this translates to uh, the large volume on the other side. Uh, well, usually the complex structure uh, would be related to the exponential of the complexified Kähler class, right? Yes, but I think that, I mean, so this is uh, what, I, I'll just say that uh, you can, I mean, th that's just, I think a variable issue, but I think when you do the translation correctly, you, you, you can just, uh, this mounts to imaginary that much, much, uh, uh, but right. okay, but I mean, essentially, essentially that uh, let's probably not worry about Kähler or complex. But the bottom line is that uh, this would really restrict because, as I said, I mean, this would at least on the Kähler sector side, uh, I mean, it would amount to having uh, manifolds. I mean, Calabi-Yaus with vanishing intersection numbers, and that would uh, severely restrict, uh, therefore, uh, the uh, the period uh, uh, in the corresponding algebraic geometry, and therefore uh, the W. Uh, so, I mean, uh, one is one aware of uh, such, uh, let's call them zero triple intersection Calabi Yaus, uh, which would contribute to a W zero. In, in, in short, let me rephrase my question. So we have this old, old, if I recall, a very old paper by Denef, Douglas, and Floria, right? DDF 99, was it? Where they tried to enumerate uh, uh, compactification that would allow KKLT. So. Do we have vanishing triple intersection Calabi Yaus in that list, which produce a very small W zero? So, uh, so here I think what is being used to get the small W zero in the construction that I described, uh, which is the recent construction by the Cornell group, is that you are uh, you're not doing anything with you're not demanding anything on the intersection number. You are demanding something on the choice of flux quantum. And so at the end, this condition on the flux quanta uh, translates to the Diophantine equations that I was describing. So you, the equations that you have, it, it involves the flux quanta, which uh, I was treating as the variables, and then there are the classical intersection numbers. So uh, you look at those equations are as equations for the flux quanta, and thereby you try to solve for the flux quanta. So no additional criteria is being imposed on the intersection numbers. Maybe some choice of intersect with some choice of intersection numbers, you will find 
more vacua, that could be possible, but we are not assuming anything about the, uh, the choice of the intersection numbers. Maybe I, I, I'm probably not following the discussion because uh, uh, just I just for one last uh, uh, clarifying comment or slash query is that I mean the perturbative expansion of the prepotentials cubic term has the coefficients given by the classical intersection numbers yes. unless they are non-zero you will always have these cubic terms so no that, that's in the prepotential but what I want I want something okay. about the superpotential. So I have to, uh, what, I'm not demanding that I, that the prepotential uh, is not cubic. I'm de uh, demanding that the superpotential uh, is a degree two homogeneous. So you have to compute uh, because see, the way this calculation goes is that from the prepotential, you compute the period matrices and then uh, you also have the uh, the fluxes which are which is again some the integrals of the fluxes over the period and then you use uh, you do the g wedge omega okay so when you do the g wedge omega you have an expression for the superpotential which has the intersection numbers and the flux quanta and this is what you want to be degree to. So it's not that you're, you're demanding that the prepotential is uh, degree two. I see. So uh, at, it really is a condition on the superpotential. So if you, I mean, if one way to say that is that you drop the exponentially small uh, connections in the prepotential and you work with just the, um, the cubic part. And with that, you compute the superpotential. And with the superpotential, which is a function of the intersection numbers and the, uh, the flux quanta should be uh, degree two in the complex structure model. Okay. Right. So that gives you an equation. This equation is to give in a fixed Calabria, this is an equation on the flux quanta and that's what you try and solve. Okay. Yeah. Gautam, Gautam has been waiting for a long time. Gautam, you have a question? Yes, uh, thank you, Gail. Yeah, I have uh, one or two questions for Ian, very short questions. So uh, can you, will you allow that? Maybe his collaborator will reply. He's, he sent me an email. Oh, he's not here. Okay, okay. Then, 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 then maybe I can talk to him directly. That, that'd be better. I mean, uh, who is the collaborator? Who is student? Yeah. Okay. Uh, maybe I, I can directly ask him. Yeah, that, that's all. That's all right. That's all right. Thank you again. Yeah, he sent me an email. So, Professor right. Alok Mishra. So, when do you use the guillotine? Oh, uh, I, I see there are no further hands which are raised. So, I think we can call it a day if, with your kind permission. So, you self annihilate your hand. Ah, yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. I, I, I apologize for that. Uh, sorry. Well, uh, there we go. So you should announce the closure of this session, right? Ah, uh, okay. Uh, yes. So, uh, so all right. So thank you so much, uh, everybody, uh, for your kind patience. And uh, so this brings us to the uh, the conclusion of uh, day one. Uh, so see you tomorrow, same time, and different link. Uh, good night. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Have bye -bye. a safe. Uh, thank stay you. Safe. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night. So team, uh, can I uh, end the meeting with your permission? Yes, sir. All uh, right. Let me just uh, stop the recording and the last ah, time. Please, please. Yeah, please do that. Please do that. Thank you so much. Okay. So I think I can end the meeting now. Yes, sir. All righty. See you tomorrow at the same time. Bye-bye. Good night.